the Raptors games were like the escape because she went through serious depression and even postpartum depression. Oh, wow. And the night our son, she went into labor was the night the a regular season game Raptors played Golden State Warriors. So the when the Raptors played the Warriors in the finals, I surprised my wife. It was so funny. Like I thought they'd win it in five games. <laughs> and, then, and then I went to I went to Ticketmaster just to see if it went six games, could there be any face value tickets? There were two in the lower bowl. Oh wow. So I bought I bought them, watched game five, everyone was devastated. And then I surprised my wife and I'm like, we're going to game six. And then <laughs> did the morning show for BT, woke up at 3 30, came home, picked her up. My mother-in-law watched our son. We flew to San Fran. It was an amazing race to get there by tip off. And then we all know what happened. So it's like, yeah, regardless of what happens, we're grateful for the Raptors. <laughs> Awesome. Welcome everybody who's streaming in. We're going to get going just another, we're going to give it one more minute and then we're going to dive right into the conversation talking basketball right now. <laughs> basketball in the snow. Globe. I was, I was telling uh, Riaz that in Toronto, those of you who are sitting here in Toronto with me, we're in the middle of a snow globe right now. And uh, I do miss that West coast weather that, although it does get quite wet, doesn't it? You guys, uh, they call it the wet coast, I think, right. As opposed to the West coast. <laughs> there's many there's many names for us over here wet coast i'll take that that's complimentary <laughs> uh as you know i spent quite a bit of time out there because my mom lives on um on vancouver island and uh, i have to say their weather is is a little bit different than the uh, vancouver's there they don't get quite the the same um rain i don't think they don't thought, get the yeah. snow either oh what, what, whereabouts on the island She's in Victoria, so she's at the south end. She's at the south end. I haven't spent too much time on the island. I know a lot of people go to Tofino for the storm watching because mm. it's just a whole different experience weather-wise. Yeah. And I guess that's the beauty of the West Coast. You just have more of the elements to explore even during the winter season, which a lot of people are doing now with hikes and just kind of keeping their distance. Yeah, no, totally. I well, I've got a lot of friends out there and they're posting pictures of a lot of snow and a lot of things going on. So anyway, well, listen, let's get this show on the road. I know people keep streaming in as we go along. So um, welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, so happy to be here uh, with our guest today, Riaz Meji, who has written a new book, Every Conversation Counts. So we're going to be diving into that. We're just going to remind you that we're going to keep everything muted, uh, but do use the chat uh, as we go along. I love these sessions to be interactive. So questions come up, put them in the chat. We'll keep watching them and, and answering your questions, but uh, we're going to start the conversation going now. Thanks, Shelby. Shelby's my wing woman who... <laughs> make sure that I don't have to try and figure out how to remove slides off the screen. But anyway, Riaz, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, it's great to have you. My pleasure. Thanks for the, the interest in the topic. And I've heard great things about the, the podcast. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> it's going to be great. So talk to me a little bit. You know, you've had a career as a broadcast journalist. And I said to you, I was joking around with you earlier. I said, I'm going to kind of resist my urge to get into all the celebrity gossip that uh, I know you've got like, you know, lots of sightlines to people. I do feel like I'm now less than six degrees of separation away from Tom Cruise now because I, I now know you. So I'm sure there's a whole host of people that I can count in my inner circle. Um, but tell me a little bit about, you know, what, after, you know, the career that you've had, what prompted you to write this book and why now? I've always been fascinated by the psychology behind human connection mm. and to interview people for a living one of the mistakes I would make earlier on is how do I get this conversation right? Like, how do I get it perfect? Hmm. And as time went by, I realized I can do all the preparation I want. And then you walk into that uh, interview or meeting or, or presentation. And then if I'm just listing off and just running off all the questions I prepared, I realize I'm like, well, I hardly need to listen at all because I've already choreographed how this conversation is going to go. Right. And I was... Over the years, I was really understanding the most powerful conversations were the ones where somebody would open up and say, you know what, I never really share this. Mm. And the ability to just be so present and listen mm. intently to, to what they're giving you that we're able to unlock something and hopefully inspire and motivate an audience to think differently. The human connection piece had always been a passion of why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. But then over the years, for those that really struggled and then had the courage to speak up, 
I started to notice some degree of loneliness that existed of if you're struggling with something, sometimes you could feel shame or embarrassment and then you isolate yourself. Mm. And that kind of puts you in a hole. And when I'd look at that pattern of one, the courage people had to share, I'd look at the impact on the audience. But then two, I started following this rabbit hole of how big is this loneliness factor for people that are struggling with any particular point in their life. Mm. And over the years, it was really emerging. I mean, what, in, the, in the research I was doing that, I call it the social pandemic where isolation and loneliness for the longest time had become an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Like pre-COVID, when I was talking about human connection, companies would say to me, yeah, that's cute. Yeah, yeah, we need that. It was so overlooked until one of the most, the greatest needs that we have that this in our DNA of just being social animals, when it was stripped away, Mm -hmm. it was front and center. And we've all felt it of how isolation impacts us and how loneliness impacts us. And in this message and in this book, I felt a great deal of uh, urgency to explore it and create a resource that could help people not only heal, but help people connect in just meaningful ways. I love that. And I I do think that's what really separates your book. I mean, you could read the title of this book, Every Conversation Counts, and think that it's another, you know, book on how to have, make connections, build relationships, and it has those elements. But I think the fact that you've really unpacked, this is, you call it the social, the social epidemic, uh, you know, this loneliness Uh, factor that we're all feeling, which is so counterintuitive when we're in a world that's so hyper connected. You know, I think it's one of those things that we um, view social media. I remember when social media was just, you know, at at the early forefront, I can remember being at conferences and people saying, get social, get connected. And yet we're seeing that the mental health aspects of all of these social platforms platforms are actually quite negative, right? They've they've, um, really sort of created a a lot of mental health issues for people along the way. So I'm kind of curious, I'm, I've got a, a number of questions around that that I'd love to unpack, but one of the things that I, I, you know, really came up for me after I read your book was, how do we, and especially now when we're in COVID, how do we go about cultivating these connections, cultivating these meaningful relationships with people? What are some of the, the things that you've been thinking about and, and advice that you give to folks? Well, the idea of cultivating the connections for me, the first step is understanding, well, what's getting in the way? Mm. And Cigna, the research firm in America, every year they come out with a study on the loneliness index. Mm. And if we could take inventory of our own lives, and for you uh, as the audience on this webinar, think about the key factors that that, that might be uh, leading to this feeling of disconnection or being depleted. And the top four that came out pre-COVID in 2020 talked about having a lack of social support, Mm. a negative perception with the relationships in your life, Uh, poor mental and physical health, and a lack of work-life balance. Mm. And if you think about that work-life balance piece alone in the remote work setup, we learned how we could do this in in a pandemic and still Mm. be productive, yet boundaries are are a big part of establishing what you need. And when we think about uh, establishing meaningful connection, One of the things I really like to focus on, especially at the beginning of our meetings, is how can we elicit positive emotion? Mm. It is so easy for us to start a meeting or presentation and just say, how are you? How is everybody? And we're going to get expected answers. Good. Yeah, everything's great. Yeah. Mm, Okay. Let's get down to business. And we miss out on that piece of how people are really doing. Mm -hmm. One of the tools that I've really used that's helped is, I call it the happiness hat trick, and I credit the late psychiatrist Gordon Livingston. And he said, when you look at the equation of what makes people happy, there are three key factors that really stand out and three key questions you can ask someone, especially if you have no context. Like imagine you're in a sales meeting and you're like, okay, I didn't know that person's going to be here. I haven't done any research on them. What do I do? How do I connect? Mm -hmm. And the three points Gordon Livingston really focused on were the happiest people have something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. Hmm. And these types of moments and questions tap into the cross section of emotion. It's what are the priorities for people? It's career, it's health, it's relationships. Mm -hmm. And how do we tap into that? You know, one of the most common questions I was being asked during the pandemic, and I, I know the intention, the, the intent was pure to check in that they'd say, Riaz, how are you coping with all this? Mm. And for me, uh, I appreciated the question. And then I thought, what if we ask people, what are you doing to take care of yourself during this? Mm. 
it's more empowering where people uh, can talk about, here's what I'm doing to recharge, to show I'm in control. I'm not just a, a victim of my circumstance. It's how can I take control and make sure uh, I'm showing up in the best way possible and also taking care of myself at the same time. Yeah, I really love that. And I mean, as you were talking, what I, I really started thinking about, and a lot of our audience are, you know, they're working corporations, they're, they've got big goals, big deliverables. And, and, you know, in many ways, this Zoom setup, where we're in these boxes, we're on screen, what I notice is that, you know, everything has become very transactional. You know, this, this idea of, okay, I've got to get into a meeting. And when we get into the meeting, we've got to talk about the subject. And now I've probably got more meetings because people are overcompensating with meetings. And so it's even more transactional. And being intentional about creating the space for connection is that you know this idea what did you call it, it was the the hat your hat trick no, it wasn't hat trick what did you say your happy hat oh the the, the happiness hat trick when i saw those three questions trick. i'm like that's that it's, it's a canadian <laughs> podcast right but like they'll remember that one <laughs> yeah. the happiness hat trick i love that and i but i think that is really you know i think one of the things for all of us that are leading teams is to recognize the importance about being intentional about building community and creating those spaces for connections in this time so so, so important yeah. like I, I i would throw this out to to our audience today if you're watching if you're listening to this in the chat box tell us what is getting in the way of real connection of what you've experienced in the past year because even before we, we jumped on it and, and we're live on this mm. we talked about the fact that 2020 is not very different from 2021 so far because yeah. we're still in this same medium of remote work and we need to find ways to hit these emotional touch points well, and I think the thing that we were talking about, and I think you're right, it'd be interesting to get um, those that are listening in if they're if they're feeling something similar was that when we started this pandemic, we really didn't know what was in store for us, right? Like, I think if somebody had said to us, okay, you're going to be like this a year from now, we all would probably lost our minds, but it kind of dripped on us, right? And I was sharing uh, everybody with Riaz, the, the situation for me is that I have a grade 12 um, graduating student who is not having the grade 12 experience that she was expecting to have prom, all of those things that, uh, you, you know, you think of your grade 12 year being. And when she compares the experience she's having with the experience of the graduates from last year who had their year cut short as a result of the pandemic, there was a lot of energy and effort and how are they feeling and let's make sure they feel good enough. Whereas this year, her group is almost feeling like we're all at like, okay, this is what it is, business as usual. And there is no acknowledgement of the feeling. And I was kind of paralleling that to in organizations 2020, you know, the start of the year is often the start of new tar targets, new goals for a lot of companies. We sort of shift that focus. We've been like this. Hey, you guys have had to deal with homeschooling. Like you're all, and it's almost like we've, we've, um, uh, are, are ignoring and, and tamping down the need for these emotional checkpoints, these emotional, and yet I kind of feel like it's, it's even more required now than it was when we started. What's kind of your, what do you, what do you think about that, Riaz? It's so easy to overlook. Like I'm looking at the comment we have, uh, maybe it was Shelby said, I missed the feeling of live meetings and events. Mm -hmm. In your case, uh, uh, the grade 12 experience, like these are milestone moments to say, I'm finishing high school, my first year of un university. Companies have talked to me about the fact that I'm onboarding people in a remote setup. Yes. We're not doing the traditional orientation. It, it's a dizzying feeling. And we're, we still work in a culture of convenience. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest things I believe this pandemic taught us is how fast we can move. Mm -hmm. Look at the evolution of tele telehealth. We're not going to the doctor's office now. It's bam, it's a video call, uh, remote learning. Now mm -hmm. we're not in these classrooms like we used to be, virtual presentations. The interesting part of this, I, I had a leader say to me, <clears throat> I was presenting at a conference and she reached out after and I asked her, what is this like for you? And the comment she said echoes what we see here. I miss that feeling of live energy mm -hmm. uh, in the big events, but everybody gets a front row seat mm -hmm. and they get to feel the emotion from the presenter. Yet at the same time, leaders became showrunners, presenters became broadcasters. We have to give so much directly to this lens. It's so important to have these check-ins and that our leaders are, are still doing those one-on-ones outside of the meetings because meetings have become more efficient than they've ever been now, yet emotion gets muted through the camera. And we need to just proactively check in with our people, check in with our customers, check in with our teams to make sure 
people are still doing okay because whether it's loneliness or other mental health issues, I strongly believe six months from now, once we have these vaccinations uh, received by the masses, there's going to be a lot of talk about the mental health impact of what this pandemic has done to people in, in this time of isolation. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I think it's going to be the, the ripple effect of this is we are going to feel this for a very long time. And I think, you know, I love what you just point touched on too, is this, you know, when you think of like all of the things that create a culture in a company, you know, the fact that we kibitz at the, you know, in the lunchroom, or we get to walk down the hallways and see each other, or, you know, I've always heard with um, employees that work remotely, that's something that they, they always feel a little bit on the outside of. This has put everybody on the outside. But then when you think of like a new employee coming into a culture and not knowing what are those cultural milestones and what are those touchstones that exist within this culture and building those relationships. And I think people aren't, um, necessarily recognizing how challenging that must be for new employees into cultures. What, like, what advice would you have for, you know, if we've, we've got people on the call that are having to bring in new people into their organizations and the culture so that they don't feel that double isolation? Because to me, that's almost like a double whammy effect. You're not able to connect, but then also you, you, you don't even have the shorthand that the rest of the organization has. Yeah. One of the points I really champion with intentional connection versus being an autopilot mode of relationships or recruitment the way we traditionally mm -hmm. did things is to really look at the idea as a leader of going first. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is on an emotional level, addressing that struggle that maybe as a leader you're experiencing or mm -hmm. recognizing a struggle the team is having. Because if you're able to do that and lead with something that's raw, that's that's vulnerable, that, that's creating a safe space to give permission to the other people to share. And it'll encourage broad participation from the team. If the leader isn't addressing it or role modeling this idea of just being open, mm. it's going to be that much harder for somebody else who's just joined to say, okay, I'm feeling this. But if the team's moving at warp speed saying the pandemic is what it is, we're going to miss out on that opportunity for that new teammate to feel that sense of belonging, to feel motivated. And our efficiency could lead to a higher sense of just alienating them altogether. Yeah, I, that's so true. And I, I, you know what, the other, so yeah, like as leaders, we need to sort of create that space to allow people to be vulnerable and, and going first and letting everybody know that it's okay, showcasing that. I also think about, you know, because um, we talk a lot in our work about, you know, leadership is situational and, you know, what you have to dial up in terms of your approach or your style um, is very much around the situation. And I think about something else that you said a little bit earlier about this idea that now as leaders, when we're on these platforms, there's a performance aspect to this. There is a way that you have to engage people. And I've seen groups where, you know, everybody goes off camera and they're hiding and, you know, and the leaders kind of left on their own delivering these town halls. And, you know, so I'm curious in the virtual world, some of the sort of uh, tips and techniques that you have from broadcasting, because when you're, when you're kind of delivering to a camera, you're, you're, you've actually been in this world that we haven't been in for, a, you know, for your whole career, kind of looking out and often having to yeah, engage people that you can't see reactions to. What are some of the things that um, you know we can do to sort of build that sense of community when it is now muted? I think we used that word earlier and there's distance. Yeah, well, the, the first thing to set yourself up for success is hide yourself for you. <laughs> like like th this is such a weird medium. Glenn, if you and I are face-to-face -face having a conversation in person, which one day, hopefully in, in 2021, hopefully. this will happen. I don't have the option of looking at myself of mm -hmm. how I'm speaking, how I'm gesturing, how I'm yeah. reacting. And this is such a new medium where it's like we're having conversations and there's a mirror beside the person you're talking to. So it's so yeah. easy to look down and be like, oh, is that, is that what my hair yeah. looks like? Oh, wait, is, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how's my <laughs> posture? And immediately I've pulled myself out of this present moment. Yeah. Like, we have this innate sense of wanting to impress and wanting a sense of belonging. And by doing that, if we start calibrating on the fly like this, as I'm looking at myself, we're losing the audience because in a webinar format like this, 
you could have a bunch of people where they're just looking at you as the presenter. So the first thing, hide the self view. Yeah. The second, and this touches on that point of you saying some leaders have their cameras off, or if you're in a sales presentation, the other side, they have their cameras off. Mm -hmm. The thing I encourage leaders to do is to call people up, not call people out. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I've coached sales teams where they've said, you know what, the other side, they don't have their cameras on. I can't read tone. I, I don't know what they're thinking. And the first thing I'll ask them is, did you ask everybody to have their cameras on well before the meeting? Mm. And they said, no. They said, we just asked during the meeting when it started. That's very tricky because we may have the best intention that we wanna see them, we wanna connect with them, yet everybody's dealing with their own unique set of circumstances in this remote world where they might be embarrassed about their space. They might not have a space that they're confident in presenting. So if this meeting is happening next Tuesday and we give them a week's notice to say, we'd really love to you to have your cameras on. We're going to have our cameras on. That gives them the chance to get ready for it. Mm. And then th they're set up for success as opposed to being blindsided. Mm -hmm. The other idea is, Glenn, if you're running the meeting and you're going to come to me, there's so many things going on. If my mic's mute, uh, uh, my mic is just muted. I could have my son screaming in the back and I'm distracted. But if I hear you say, Riaz, I'm going to come to you in a couple of minutes here, but first we're going to cover this off. Yeah. That activates me to be in the ready mo mode as opposed to just catching me off guard. Mm -hmm. And it allows me to just deliver with, with more confidence. And, you know, the, the other factor is on our side, Glenn, if we're presenting for a group, we're presenting when we're not presenting. Mm -hmm. If you want the other side to have their cameras on, I encourage the entire team that is presenting, keep your cameras on the entire time. Mm -hmm. Because what is great listening in the virtual medium how can we convey listening when we don't have those nonverbal gestures that we're used to in person is showing that you're being altered by what is said. Mm. So even if I'm not presenting, my camera's still on and I'm listening to you the entire time. I'm nodding. Yeah. I could be taking notes. They could see me doing that and they'll see, Hey, the rest of their team cameras on, they're fully attentive in the process. Mm -hmm. And these types of subtleties role model the idea of what intentional connection will look like. And it'll encourage the other side to do the same. And how, how would you, what strategies would you suggest for, because I think people have different levels of um, extroversion, introversion, emotional, um, you know, uh, or energy readiness to kind of bring the presence, bring the presentation. So what would you suggest to people who maybe find this whole medium very draining? You know, they're really drained by it. Any sort of strategies or hacks that you could give people on managing energy and how to bring your best, even if it's maybe not your preferred medium, and yet we're all forced into it right now. Yeah, to, to just proactively practice uh, out loud. And mm -hmm. if you have a big presentation coming up, the beautiful advantage we have in virtual is the cameras rolling, set that record, and then watch yourself. And th there's a great game that I credit uh, coach Nick Morgan that he introduced to me when I was researching for this book and it's called the, the happy sad game. Mm -hmm. So if you have maybe two or three minutes of your presentation, deliver it with the intent of, I'm gonna read this copy in the happiest state of mind and the happiest energy I could convey to the camera. Then do a second take and do it in a sad state of mind mm -hmm. and record both. Mm -hmm. And then when you've done that, watch them back and watch the level of emotion that shows up through the lens. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, I'm finding leaders are surprised to say, well, I was so happy when I read that. I felt I was happy, but I didn't look happy. happy. Interesting. It's a complete different projection through the camera than it is live on stage or in a boardroom. So that art of practicing and then being conscious of looking at uh, movement, uh, intensity, uh, are you varying the vocal music of, you know what, I'm going to make a really important point that I need everybody to listen to. Yeah. And then there could be this huge excitement. I couldn't believe this happened. We need to create that variance so there isn't a, a, a long duration of sameness mm. in a virtual call because it, the audience will fall into a passive state. Yeah. And you know, what's really occurring to me as you're talking is I think that when we prepare for formal presentations, you know, we do that. We do the dry runs, we do the practice, we kind of get our thing. 
And so when we bring it into, there's the, there's the, the, the uh, adjustments we need to make because now we're in a screen and we got people who are off camera and how do we do that? But then I think of the same intentionality that we need to think about when we're going into our team meeting into our regular standard every week sales call or our monthly meeting as you know in terms of thinking about that with intention intentionality because we have to sort of be mindful of um this is a different medium this might re require different things from you and how are you whether it's a mental dry run practice or something else um to really uh, make sure that you're bringing the best out of the conversation and, and uh, the engagement level. Because I think it's so easy to be, um, well, we, you know, we've got this new word right now. We're all Zoomified, right? We're all Zoombies. And so how do you break through the Zoombiness, right? As a leader to make sure people are connecting to the message. And you just really think, made me think about, yeah, it's not just though the big stuff too. It's also how are we being intentional in the small moments? And in those small moments, that opportunity to share and rotate the power. Ah, if, we yeah. look at the, if we look at an example of a virtual team meeting, I liken that to a newscast. You check in. If you're watching the six o'clock news, you don't just see the anchor at the desk for the full hour. Mm -hmm. You have that visual variety where we're going to different reporters. Mm -hmm. They all know they have ownership in that actual broadcast or meeting in our case. Mm -hmm. And as leaders, if we divide and conquer and everybody knows I'm going to have an element whether I'm presenting for two minutes or there's going to be a Q&A and uh, Glenn could come to me at any time. That's going to keep them in a ready and activated mode as opposed to just sitting back the whole time of, yeah, uh-huh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and just sharing that responsibility, that's a big part on, on the, the virtual team meeting side. Yeah, I love that. So like your book, I, I, I think I said to you, you know, it's like a master class in terms of, you know, deepening relationships and we, we can do that. And just to pick up on what you were just talking about there, because I mean, I think the first one you talk about in the book is listen without distraction. And I think it's very easy in this world to, you know, I mean, I could be sitting here playing Candy Crush, you know, if I, <laughs> for all I know, and I've had friends say, oh yeah, I'm up to this level on this video game during my uh, team meetings, right? So um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, how, how can we create the conditions for people to listen without distraction? How do you, how do you right size that if you know that you've got, situations where that's um, going south. And um, so we'd sort of love to hear that because I, I feel like distraction is generally a problem. Um, <laughs> it is for me anyway. <laughs> Speak to, big challenge. Now, now my challenge is to keep you from playing Candy Crush in this response. Game on, let's go. <laughs> my phone is turned off and over there. <laughs> uh, the first thing with listening without distraction, I mean, listening has become good, like real attentive listening has become extinct next to the idea of having authentic curiosity about someone uh, other than ourselves. Yeah. And, and, and knowing this, this notion of everyone saying, oh, okay, Riaz is gonna tell me how to listen. Yeah. What I wanna encourage is recognizing what shows up in your life in terms of distractions. <clears throat> and the reason I wanted to focus on this is that some of the research I uncovered was that the average person speaks at 125 words per minute, yet our brains can absorb 500 words per minute. Mm. And if you look at how our minds are working on a baseline, that means that 75% that we don't necessarily need to absorb the message that's coming at us, we need to channel that energy so it's not caught up in daydreaming, multitasking, technology, candy crush, all, <laughs> all of these things, our minds could, could easily go there. Mm -hmm. So one, it's awareness of what distractions exist for us because those are all unique in a remote setting. It could be something in your background. Somebody's drilling upstairs, your dog's barking, your kid's screaming, all of these factors, understanding what they are and then what gets in the way and then try and pick them off one by one because it could be an overwhelming task to keep you as present as possible. Mm. The second idea is over-prepare to improvise. Like when I would interview guests, like I mentioned right off the top, the mm. biggest mistake I would make is doing all of this research, all of this due diligence, and then thinking, I'm just going to uh, show off my intellect with my questions and, and try and wow the person. Right. It, it truly, it is not about me as the person asking the questions. It's, it's giving that person the space to share something that's fresh, that's new, because the preparation, and I'm not discounting preparation, 
that's going to give us confidence. Mm -hmm. But to actually lean in, listen, and be willing to improvise with what they're giving you, that is real connection. Mm -hmm. And some of the baseline questions, like one of my favorites in the green room, if I was interviewing anybody, regardless of the research, I would ask them, so what's happening? Like, what's on your mind right now? Mm -hmm. And the first thing that comes out of their mouth, I, I begin to understand what's the priority for them. And then I shape the narrative around that. And then I let them lead. And the interesting part of that, and the third point that I make under listening without distra distraction is to document their details, but not in like a business way, because in any business meeting, we're taking notes. If we're truly trying to connect with someone, I encourage you to, to explore and try to discover the uncommon commonality. Mm. And I'll give you an example. Years ago, I was uh, a host for the Connects for Kids Fund telethon that we do inside Rogers Arena. And the first year I did it, this was with the Sportsnet crew and I was working with City and Breakfast Television. So I didn't know who the head honchos were, mm. but I knew on email that there was going to be a big producer that was going to oversee the production. Mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't seen him. Uh, like I didn't know what he looked like, but when he walked in, I could tell everybody else's body language, big boss is here, <laughs> they're, they're busy. Uh oh. And he, and he came over and I just engaged on, on a basic, you know, basic level. And I looked at my phone just to check the time of when we were going live and we were about 10 months, uh, 10 minutes out. And he saw on my phone, there was a photo of my rescue dog at the time, whose name was Smiley. And we had rescued this dog from the dog meat trade in Thailand. And he kind of smiled and he said, hey, th that's cool. We, we love a dog too. I've got a rescue dog named Daisy. Mm -hmm. So we went back and forth on our love of animals told me about this ESPN documentary about a dog named Arthur. If, if you Google anything later and love animals, check out this doc. You will have tears in your eyes of this <laughs> dog that discovered this ultra marathon race. Oh, wow. Production goes through. It's a success. We raise a bunch of money. A year later, this same producer emails me and he says, hey, Riaz, we appreciated your contribution last year. Would you be interested in coming back and hosting on the telethon? And you know, in emails, when it's been... A significant amount of time, the easy thing we can do is, hey, so-and-so, hope you're well. What I try to do in every email is to eliminate hope you're well and replace that with something that is so personal, this uncommon mm -hmm. commonality. Mm -hmm. So I just said to him, hey, thanks for the invitation. I uh, would love to do it. By the way, how's Daisy? Mm. 10 minutes later, he called me. And the biggest thing of listening without distraction is if you can give the person your attention and document these details in a way that they can say to you this one line, I can't believe you remembered that. Mm -hmm. You will have trust and you will have such a deeper connection. And I encourage people, we can't remember it on our own, document these things, write it down after the conversation because it will make a huge difference with your teams. And if you're, if you're working in sales, they'll say, that person listened to me, I wanna work with them. Yeah, you know, I have a friend of mine, he's a long time executive recruiter. And it's really cute. Whenever, I, whenever I used to see him, he literally had a glide file and he had printouts of all the emails that had gone back and forth between us. He had his own little notes about stuff. And he was always so prepared. I love that he was actually that transparent with me showing me like how he was keeping track of our relationship. But um, just truly, it's an intentional skill, right? If you really want to make that deep connection. So give us, you know, like in the book, so that like, listen without the distraction was one and, uh, for sure for me when I read that chapter, I'm like, Woo, lots to kind of continue to remind myself of here. Give us the highlights of the other four. And is there one other one that you want to kind of give us a bit more color around? Because it's, it, there's just, they're all great, but give the audience a bit of sense of what else is covered off in your book and highlights. Okay, I, 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 this, this is going to be like the let's poll the audience. So I'm going to give you the other four. And then uh, if you're watching this, you tell me what piques your interest. Uh, yeah. One of them was making your small talk bigger, uh, putting aside your perfect persona being assertively empathetic, and then finding a way to make people feel famous. And when you think about the challenges you have with connections, you tell me if, if you're watching this, uh, what stands out to you of habits that pique your interest of, what helps you listen better? What helps you connect more? Because a, a lot of these habits, when I look at it all, this isn't groundbreaking stuff. It, a lot of it is, is common sense ideas that just get overlooked because we just want to move at such an efficient pace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So audience, you hear, would you be interested to hear more about making the small talk bigger, 
Um, give us the other three. Yeah, put aside your perfect persona, uh, finding ways to be assertively empathetic. And in this culture where we need to lift people up, find ways to make people feel famous. Yeah, what do you guys want to know more about? Personally, assertively empathetic. That's, a, that's almost like an oxymoron. That, <laughs> or that, contradiction. Yeah. How do you be assertively empathetic? I have to say, when I read the book, you know, for me, like the small talk chapter was great because I, I just have such an aversion to small talk. I, I just like even just the words small talk. Um, <laughs> it's just like, oh, it makes me cringe. Oh, we got people putting in their votes. Okay. Uh, let's Jill, see here. Sort of assertively uh, empathetic. Assertively empathetic. empathetic. <laughs> Thank oh, Shelby wants to know about making people famous. <laughs> all right, let's go with assertively empathetic to start, and I'm sure we can circle back to all. But like, talk talk to us about that. What is assertively empathetic? The, the the biggest idea behind assertive empathy is that relationship is the foundation for any productive conversation. And when we look at the <clears throat> polarized climate, hold on one second. I'm gonna hit the mute button. Be respectful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we look at the conversations we're having right now and prime example on the political spectrums mm. of just a great divide is how we put the relationship first. Right. And under this habit is relationship first, logic second. Mm. And this notion of relationship first really involves that listening component that even if we disagree with someone, like ask ourselves this, when somebody is presenting an ideology, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a philosophy an ideology that's so different from how you look at life, what happens in your mind? And what distractions show up? Do you get emotionally charged? Do you jump in to interrupt? Do you give unsolicited advice? Do you try and fix the issue? Mm -hmm. This really involves this habit of just listening and asking these questions that uh, allow the person to share. And when they've opened up, acknowledging their point of view, recapping their point of view, and then looking at the greater good and focusing on what you can agree on that, look, we're trying to accomplish this thing together. Mm -hmm. And what I hear you, you're, you're saying is A, B, and C. And I agree with A, B. And once they've felt heard, it's almost disarming for them being on the other side where they understand, okay, we're in this together. Then that logic comes in to introduce this other opinion. And then the proof and anecdote that can back it up. I find in the conversations, we're so quick to shoot from the hip of why we disagree that we discount and dismiss the idea that someone's really given us. So we assertively need to check ourselves mm. and just let that person share first and then share openly and then just have this productive dialogue. Because if you look at your life and anyone you disagree with, Think about how that dynamic shifts when you guys already have respect, trust, and transparency. Mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference to try and accomplish a new set of ideas or outcomes as opposed to a complete stranger where you're like, no, I think you're wrong and here's why. And then it just becomes a competition versus a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think too, depending on how hard you're wired, as you were talking, I was thinking about my husband. My husband and I are on polar opposites um, when it comes to needing to win. Um, I'm the one who doesn't need to win, by the way, just kidding. I'm the one who needs to win. Um, <laughs> so what I find is when you said, uh, you know, in the conversation to acknowledge back, I agree with A, I agree with B, and let me give you my opinion on C. That is so true. And I think for anybody who's like a type A crazy personality um, that can relate to me on this particular story, like I will say that it is so hard for me to do the acknowledging because I, I, I immediately want to skip ahead into the, well, let's debate this out because I also get energy from debating, right? And, and so I skip the empathy piece because I'm almost like, oh, you know what? We're married. He, he knows I'm on his team, but I just want to get into this conversation. It never goes well. Like it never goes well, right? And so it really, um, I think this idea of slowing it down, acknowledging the other person, so hugely important. And I think a lot of, you know, a lot of us in leadership roles, we got there because we're pretty good at putting our opinions out there and uh, being able to defend our opinions. Yeah. The, <laughs> as you <laughs> described the relationship piece, I had somebody say to me before I got married, uh, I always remember this advice was, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be in a relationship? And 
look, my wife's an entertainment lawyer. So her, her logic and debating skills way up here. I'm going to lose that debate every single time. But the thing that I always look at, and I try to catch myself at this, because somebody said to me last week, well, does your wife ever, ever say to you, you're not listening to me? And I said, yeah, she does. Th this isn't something that I've perfected. This is something that I've become more aware of, of how I can continuously evolve and improve. And it involves this degree of staying open. Because yeah. imagine you're talking to somebody and you hear a common excuse or narrative. They're always telling themselves of why they haven't done something that they keep talking about. In our minds, we could just say, here we go again. But if we're doing that, we've shut ourselves off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if we're still, you know, checking ourselves assertively and giving that empathy to ask the questions of well, what makes you think that's going to fail? And then they could talk about a previous experience or they could talk about a process or outcome that didn't work. It's almost if we can consistently be assertively empathetic, we don't have to give them that advice. It's almost the questions we can ask and listen and reflect will allow them to self-diagnose where they're at so they can have their own breakthroughs. Mm. And if they do that, they'll look at you, Glenn, and say, man, she's such a great listener. But all you really did was ask the questions to unlock what they already know. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I mean, and, and I think... <laughs> You, you know, I, I love that somebody said to you, like, does your wife ever tell you you don't listen? Because I think the thing is when you're in this professionally, you know, I'm a professional coach. My husband's a psychotherapist. You'd think this house would be filled with people who are great at listening. <laughs> that is not the case. And in fact, what was funny the other day, my husband and I got into an argument and our daughter was sitting in the middle of the conversation. We we're having a back and forth about it. And I said to her, what do you think? And she goes, I think you're two very different people who don't really listen to each other very well. <laughs> Oh, hang wow. on sister that is the because this does require such a focused intentionality right yeah. like I, I think we can't assume that we're going to be because and especially if we know we do it professionally does that mean that we're pulling that those skills into our personal life probably mm. not and I, I don't know about you, but I, I know that's where energy management and things come up. At the end of the day, if I've had a day where I've been doing a lot of listening, it is harder for me to maintain that energy when I'm at home in my uh, private life and vice versa, right? Like if I've been having a lot of stuff going on personally and then I have to bring, you know, that energy. So the importance of being super intentional about these practices is what's really striking me as we're, as we're talking. The biggest thing as you describe that is Somebody asked me, what, what, what do you hope? How do you hope you impact people with, mm. with, with the book as a resource? And it's that note you just hit there that we look at the idea of connection is intentional and get out of the auto autopilot mode because it's so easy, especially with our partners to go through the routine of what are we doing tonight? What are we going to have for dinner? What are we going to do on the weekend? Yeah. Well, we're not going to do anything on the weekend because we're in lockdown. Like it's just, it feels <laughs> like Groundhog Day, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it, it really involves us to just, proactively get curious about just discovery. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've always tried to catch myself on is I've been so quick to just try and fix it because I don't want to see people suffer. But at the same time, it's not on me to fix it. It's on them. And the way I can serve is to really promote the idea of discovery for them. And that takes listening. Mm -hmm. That takes uh, powerful questions. That takes stripping away the perfection of, hey, it's not always going to be perfect. There's going to be dynamics where there's tension, but just recognizing that's a part of the process. You don't have to get it right, but if you get intentional about how to make it a healthy dynamic, it'll make a huge difference. I love that. Okay. So listeners, this is your time to start asking questions. We're in the back quarter. So uh, get your questions into the chat. If you've got some for, uh, for Riaz, time to kind of pick his brains. I do think I want to hear the, uh, how to make people feel famous. Cause I love that angle. I, I really, that's what I really loved about your book was, you know, you sort of really do bring in the parallels to the world of broadcasting and you've got some great uh, you know, kind of your own experiences with uh, the folks that you worked with over the years. But talk to us about how to make people feel famous. Yeah, that habit really encapsulates uh, the other four habits, because mm. especially in this space that we're in, uh, the psychologist William James, he had a great line that the greatest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. Oh, yeah. I remember reading that years ago. And then recognizing interview after interview, the one great need we all have is to have a champion in our corner. Mm. Someone that's going to say, Glyn, I recognize the great work you're doing on this podcast. 
you know, I appreciate the community that you have that's throwing in these questions that they want to grow, they want to connect. You are making a difference. And I, I think intentional, maybe 2020, the, 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 the overused word was pivot. No. <laughs> word in this chat will be intentional because it's being even intentional about the praise we give. Mm. If somebody's done something that truly is remarkable, instead of stopping short with, hey, great job, how can we make our praise specific mm -hmm. and saying, you know what, Glenn, when you got real about the dynamic of the expertise in your relationship, the challenge that still exists, that really resonated with me. So getting specific, making it personal, making it public and sharing. If somebody's done something great, creating that space to celebrate them so it motivates them. And then uh, just making it urgent, not waiting. Because in this space right now, a lot of people are wondering, is this, does this work really matter? Is what I said in the meeting, like, is that impactful? Mm -hmm. If as a leader, we can just be so much more intentional with just celebrating our champions. And if there's milestone moments we can create, and surprise people with these special details of what's important to them, it elevates them and makes them feel like a star. And I, I truly feel like that's what we need right now in this space where we're all kind of struggling with the isolation. Yeah, it's so true. Um, oh, Shelby's asking, she's got a question. Any tips for making these intentions part of a regular habit? Like how do you build it into habits? You don't have to think about it as intention. Yeah, <laughs> I like that Shelby, starting small. It's so easy to get overwhelmed with, okay, Riaz gave a, a lot of habits here, a lot of sub points underneath, where do I start? Mm -hmm. And uh, a simple baseline and um, the intention of making people feel famous and celebrating each other is how to cultivate this idea and a culture of gratitude with your teams and your cultures. And, and I'm, not, I'm not getting all, hey, break out the gratitude journal, you gotta write all this <laughs> on, a, on a simple baseline. An interview uh, years ago with a gentleman by the name of Chris on the downtown east side really helped shift my perspective on habits. And he had been brought in by a group with the whole way house. He kept to himself for the upwards of a year, but they'd always invite, and mind you, this was pre-COVID, they'd always invite Chris down for dinner. Like his life had gone sideways. They brought him in and they just said, come join us. Mm -hmm. And in that culture, finally, he realized like he mattered. He had a sense of new belonging. And one of the philosophies they championed was on the daily to talk about what I get to. Mm -hmm. These three words, I get to. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the habits of how things show up, I, I was doing a deep dive with research and people that write down three things they're grateful for Every single day for 21 days, research has shown it creates a more optimistic mindset for up to six months. So on a baseline with your habits, to answer Shelby's question, try this. When you wake up in the morning or you go to bed thinking what you get to do the next day, instead of an obligation of, ah, oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I've got to talk to Riaz today for this podcast. If it's, hey, I get to have this conversation. I get to present to this group. I get to be with my partner and have this healthy debate. It, it switches your mindset to stay open. And that's the biggest habit in all of this for these conversations and our relationships of how to have a way to stay open, that the challenge is still an opportunity. The adversity can serve your growth. And what do you get to work through? And I guarantee you, people have their own personal silver linings. Like if you're watching this, you tell me right now, what has been your greatest silver lining during the pandemic? What did you get to do that you thought would be a challenge that served you in a great way? You tell me in that chat box. I guarantee, Glenn, there are many personal responses to that one. Yeah, I mean, I think that is it, right? Like, I mean, and, and you know, it's funny because I was, you said Groundhog Day earlier, one of my favorite movies of all time. And I forced my family to rewatch it recently. And uh, after watching it, I said, this is the pandemic. You know, like Bill Murray's journey through that movie goes from, denial like what the heck is happening to you know absolute rage to despondency you know throwing himself off buildings and all of that kind of stuff to finally acceptance where he can become a virtuoso pianist and ice sculptor and all of those things and I think we're all that is the journey we can choose to take and we can get stuck in denial and resistance and anger and you know disappointment and all of those kinds of things or we can choose to 
move through and and learn what we can take from this in terms of silver linings. You had said something earlier, and and what I really loved in your book um, is your final chapter where you talk about your dad and uh, your dad passed away. And I I said to you when we were having the pre I could really relate to it. You know, I lost my father as well several years ago, and I was at a distance. You know, both of us had that experience of trying to, you know, flying in and, and, you know, trying to be there. And, um, you know, when you talked earlier about recognizing people and not letting the moment pass, I think about that, you know, in our relationships. And, um, and this is, I think, one of the, the things that the pandemic has given us is some space to connect. And so I'm curious with your dad, what did your dad teach you about relationships and building connections with people? Were there some lessons that you took from him that you brought forward? Yeah, I appreciate this question. And the, the grief conversation is probably one that uh, needs to be had more because chances are we know someone that's been impacted by COVID, maybe mm-hmm. you've lost a loved one. Uh, on my dad's level, uh, it's funny, like you discover many things after somebody is gone uh, about that person. And I found a, a Whitney Houston CD <laughs> in his car. It was his only English language CD. And I'm like, wow, dad still use Whitney CDs? Houston, that's old. Wow. That's old school. He liked the divas. <laughs> and and on the CD, uh, there uh, track four on the album really resonated to us because the song is called I Look to You. Mm. And I wondered, I, I never knew my dad listened to Whitney Houston. And I wondered what resonated with him? Like, why did he have this CD? And the I Look to You, I thought, I'm like, what did I look to him for? And a conversation five years before I got married, my dad sat down with me and we were kind of talking about life and the challenges we're going to face. And something that he said to me, I found so relevant during the pandemic. And he said, every experience you have will be temporary, Mm. whether it's a high, whether it's a low, but never lose sight of the fact that your potential is permanent. Mm. And during this time, it's, it's, it's really made me think about uh, whatever challenge that has thrown everything for a loop, thinking, no, there's still something to offer here. Mm. There's still a way to serve. It's just going to be done in a different way. Like I never would have imagined. This used to be my son. My son is like just over two years old. This used to be his bedroom. The crib was right beside here where the computers. This is the new office and studio where I do this work. Never would have thought that could happen. Mm. And he was a champion. Track one on that Whitney Houston album is Million Dollar Bill. (laughs) He was a champion of making people feel safe and making them feel famous, making them feel special like a million dollar bill. Mm. And he really role modeled that. And so many people after he was gone would say that to me of, yeah, your dad always made time for us. He always checked in with us. And that proactive idea, even if someone hasn't told you they're struggling, it's hard to read the signs in a video frame. Yeah. Us as leaders of how we can consistently reach out to our people and check in with them and make sure they're, they're doing okay. is something I kind of channel with my dad and, uh, and, and hopefully serve in this space that, that we're working through right now. Well, and I think too, I, I mean, and uh, the reason and we talked about this before in terms of bringing this into the conversation today, um, you know, I think it is such an important conversation. I think we don't talk about grief in our culture generally, and we certainly don't talk about it in the workplace. And as a leader, you got your two weeks bereavement leave and then come on back in and get leading those teams and get delivering those results. And, and I think, you know, um, having had the experience myself of going through it and trying to run a business and then working with coaching clients who have huge losses and everything else, I think, you know, this idea of, um, you know, I think a lot of people say, well, I just don't know what to say. I just don't know what to, um, how to, I want to make that connection, but I'm not sure how to do it. So as you walk this journey, I mean, what, what kind of advice would you have for people, people listening who haven't, because I do think until you walk the journey, it's hard to know, but what's been your learning from being on the, this journey that you would say to people? Oh, that's so good. That's so good. I love that you brought this up. Uh, two things stand out, uh, Glenn, as you introduce that one, uh, the, the thing that I learned of anybody that's struggling, especially if they've lost a loved one, that somebody told me that death is a date on the calendar, mm. but grief is the calendar. Mm. It's so when it, it's immediate when something has happened, everybody's there, everybody reaches out and everybody says, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss, thoughts and prayers, my condolences. And then slowly that attention just dwindles. 
-hmm. And then if you're going through it, you hit that six month mark and it hits you, that person is gone. You hit the anniversaries of the one year of their birthday, of their death date, all of those things hit you and not everybody's there. And there was a moment where I was, this is the last in-person event I did. I work with the Connect Place Children's Hospice with their galas when they have courageous parents that take the stage and share the unthinkable of losing a loved one, losing their child. Mm -hmm. And they speak to the powerful work the hospice does to help the families heal. Mm -hmm. And I emcee this event for them every year here in Vancouver. And I remember this was months after I had lost my father. I was sitting at the head table. The parents were to my left and the head psychiatrist at Canuck Place Children's Hospice was beside me and her name was Deb. And I looked at her and I said, Deb, how do you do this work? Like, what do you say to somebody? This exact question you're asking me, Glenn, of someone that is suffering. Because I, 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 would, I felt like I've always failed people when they've lost somebody. I avoided it. I didn't want to offend them. I didn't want to trigger them. And I'm like, what do you say, Deb? And she said, Riaz, it's not about something you can say to them. It's about what you can ask them. And I said, well, what's the best question? And she said, simply ask this. What do you want me to know about them? Mm -hmm. That's a lovely question. And I just thought it's such a beautiful question because you're inviting that person that is struggling to share what they feel comfortable with. And if, if there's one thing you take out of this conversation today, if you know somebody is struggling, if they've lost somebody, ask them that question. If they're struggling, simply asking, what do you want me to know about what you're struggling with? And giving them the space to share, the people that have lost someone, the first response you'll get is thank you for asking that question. And more often than not, you'll get a beautiful story about that person and what they meant to them. And it's been profound, the conversations that have happened and the sharing that happens, giving people that permission and access. I love that. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that because I think it is one of the topics. And when we're talking about building connections with others, you're right. I think most of us are natural intended to go back and not want to upset somebody. And that's often not what people need. And I also love, you know, point out that date on the calendar. I think that's the, you know, that is the difference. And so checking in three months later, six months later, I know for me, grief's been a journey. <laughs> I remember you asked me, you said, how long has it been for your dad? And I'm like, it's going to be 10 years this year, right? It doesn't change that there are moments where, you know, I really miss my dad, right? So um, to wrap this up, we won't wrap it up on this note, but let's talk, what are you most excited about? What are you most looking forward to in 2021? What's, what's coming up for you this year that you're looking forward to? Uh, hugs and handshakes. <laughs> Can we get those back <laughs> in 2021? Be great. I, you know what? I'm just really excited about the, the space. Everybody says we're in this together. I'm excited about just being back together. Mm. You know, the communal touch points of safely going to a, a movie theater, going to see live theater. I, I'm a big Raptors fan. Being able to see a basketball game, a sporting event with thousands of people around you again. I really look forward to that energy being a reality again and doing it in a way where we don't have to wear masks. We don't have to think, is this safe? Of just getting past this. Mm. I think it's been exhausting on many levels of the constant paranoia and anxiety and doing the work now to keep us all safe so we can enjoy life later and just appreciate the small things that maybe we took for granted before mm -hmm. and what human connection really means and how great a need it is in our lives. So I'm just... Yeah, I'm really looking forward to being back together with people and just being present uh, in, in a much more intimate way. Oh, amen. Absolutely. And, um, you know, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today and uh, this human connection, reaching out, breaking down these barriers of social isolation. So important for all of us right now. And I highly recommend everybody grab copies. Now, Riaz, is your book out now or are you just in the process of launching it? Uh, Feb 9th, they'll be available in stores and uh, on the on the website. I like to support the the indie retailers too. Uh, Riazmegji.com. You have to learn how to spell Megji. Apologies in advance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the details about the book are on there. If this conversation resonated with you and you wanted more information. Yeah. And, and Riaz also has a great YouTube channel with lots of short video clips where he really kind of dives into some specific things. So everybody um, give it a watch, but thank you, Riaz. I'm going to kind of let everybody know what's coming up next for us. And uh, 
So, oh, here comes Shelby with her PowerPoint slides. So I think most of you on the call probably know who we are, but just in case you're new to the round table, we're a group coaching, team coaching company and help leaders navigate change, disruption and growth and get intentional about their leadership. Um, we do have a open enrollment program coming up uh, that because we do it virtually, you can be anywhere on the planet and take advantage of it. Our roundtable for leaders program. This is going to be for a senior manager director level group. So looking for if you're looking to kind of upskill um, yourself in the middle of a pandemic and figure out how to adjust your style, uh, definitely reach out, learn more about that. Uh, my book is available if you want to start your own grassroots leadership revolution, like Riaz, we talk about loneliness and how do you create your cohort of support. So this could be a great companion piece, uh, our two books together for folks out there. And um, finally, we've got our next Ask the Expert session is with Bob Joseph, lovely, lovely um, gentleman who wrote a book called 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act. And I think he's extremely generous with that title because I can tell you I knew nothing about the Indian Act when I read the book. And we're going to talk about Indigenous peoples, the lessons that we can learn um, from that group. And so really looking forward to that conversation with Bob on February 9th. So registration is open for that now. So thank you, everybody. It was great seeing all of you. Enjoy. Uh, if you're in Toronto, have a safe day walking around the block with your dog, if that's what you're doing, because that's about as far as we can all go. But Riaz, thank you again so much for your time today. Thanks, guys. Appreciate this, Glenn. Awesome to be with you. Thanks. Great to have you.